first drinking is fun, then drinking is fun with problems, then it's just problems. And that was certainly my experience because at the beginning it was fun and everything felt controlled until walking out of the jail. I remember exactly what the guards there had said as I was walking out. He said, I guess we'll be seeing you tomorrow, you drunk. One thing that stuck with me that my sponsor told me early on was it doesn't get easier, it gets better. That really stuck with me because there's still things that are thrown at me. And I mean, I still have anxiety. It's not like anxiety goes away. Fear is not necessarily an enemy. I mean, if we didn't have it, we'd all be running around like psychopaths. So Adam, we're going to get into your story because it is remarkable. Before we do, I've got to share a few key points of your backstory. So you are an elite amateur triathlete and a coach. You've worked your way up through the ranks and have actually qualified for the Ironman World Championship in Kona. And of course, you are the author of the new book, Shifting Gears, which tells a story of how you were able to transform your life from anxiety and addiction to a triathlon world championship. That transformation is is ridiculous. And so I think just to quickly help set the scene for the conversation we're going to have, help me understand how addiction really played into your life. Well, addiction was my life for a good, uh, more than a decade. When I entered college, I started to, to drink more socially and immediately found that it was, it was something that was missing in my life before that point. Alcohol and was missing in your life? Alcohol. Well, that's how I felt at the time. You know, I felt that alcohol was was something that was like this good friend that I never found. And that was my first experience with it because I had this subtle or this this really dormant anxiety that was in me that that I felt was there, but I never knew what it was because we never talked about that when we were when when I was young, the, the topic of mental health or anxiety or anything like that wasn't just it wasn't discussed. So social anxiety, all of the spazziness that I experienced and and all of that, it, when I took a drink, when I took my first drink and I had, you know, three beers, the first time I drank that anxiety just immediately went away. And it was like, Whoa, you know, I feel I could talk to people. I could talk to girls. I could talk to, and that kind of started that imprinted in itself, something that I wanted to chase for the next 10 years, that feeling. Is it the feeling like, Oh, I finally unlocked the real version of me, the, the version I was always hoping that I could be. That's exactly how it felt at the beginning. Yeah. So, so starting out and, th- and there's a saying within, uh, you know, recovery that first drinking is fun, then drinking is fun with problems, then it's just problems. And that was certainly my experience because at the beginning it was fun. It, it didn't feel like it was a problem and, and everything felt controlled. And, you know, I was positively reinforced by friends and, and all of that good stuff. And yet, so it just, it felt like it was who I was meant to be. And then, so my identity got shaped around it for that first period, that first year of of that experience until it started becoming problematic. Because once I started noticing that the drinking became a problem, I also, that was when my anxiety started getting so much worse. So it was a chicken or the egg thing. You know, where did the anxiety come from? And I know that I knew that it was becoming very bad because I would start to just randomly have these panic attacks. And, and so I didn't exactly know which was, which was the right way. So I just knew I was living a disordered lifestyle, this, this lifestyle of when I was sober, I was having panic attacks. I was having all of this anxiety. I didn't feel like I was myself. I feel like there was a monster living in my head. And then when I was drinking, it, it didn't feel like me either anymore because I would no longer like myself as a drunk. And I would black out and I would forget things and and those sorts of things. So it was becoming two problematic sides of of who I was. And I I remember that period of time living in, you know, going to college in the most beautiful place in the world. I had no reasons to be, feel like I was uh, 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 in, in a torturous or traumatized situation. I was, you know, the most fortunate person I could possibly be, except for everything that was going on in my mind and how I was choosing to treat it. Why didn't you go talk to a doctor or go on medication or or any of that kind of stuff? I did after it became really uh, problematic. I did go to a doctor, though at that time, I, I never wanted to admit that I had a drinking problem or that I was drinking too heavily. So I did get the medication and tended to mix the medication with the with the alcoholism. I just didn't, I feared that if I if I told the doctor about the heavy drinking that they would just say, well, you need to stop drinking. That'll take the anxiety away. So that touches the mind of, of someone who's, you know, who's battling with that kind of addiction. It's never rational. 
And uh, so I would, I would take the medication um, and I would drink. It would help a bit, but it was definitely not a healthy option by any stretch of the imagination. And meanwhile, you're, you know, you're in college and then later you're working. You, you have friends, you have relationships, you're with, you know, you're with your girlfriend. I, I believe she becomes your wife. Yes. What did, what did everyone in your circle think about all this? A lot of, I, I tried to hide it from a lot of people. When I was in college, um, most of my friends, uh, while I was, while I was drinking and it was fun, would be doing a lot of the same things. Every once in a while I would get too drunk and say, wow, you, you got a little crazy last night, Adam. Or, you know, and it was like, yeah, I should probably stop for a while. And I did, but, you know, never anything that, that anybody really suspected except for my girlfriend, wife and her brother-in-law and uh, sister uh, uh, at that time. So, um, they, so they noticed it. So what, what they noticed, what it, was, yeah. they just didn't say anything or what? They, they did. My, my wife would give ultimatums every once in a while and I would stop drinking to get the heat off. And especially, this was especially true after we got out of college. I, um, you know, I would, uh, uh, you know, drink for a while and it's, it was one of those situations where I was holding my wife hostage emotionally because she wanted to be with me and she loved me for who I was. She saw something deeper in me and she's the most wonderful, strongest person in the world. But this is, this is one of those things. And one of those messages for, for people who are, who are sharing a life with an addict is that there's a lot of manipulation that goes on on the side of the um, of the addict, and I would work really hard to convince her that I I didn't have a problem and and that uh, she, um, uh, you know, that that I could that I could maintain myself, or I would stop drinking for a while to get the heat off, and and then you know once I did, I would work my way into this into drinking again, and so it was this ugly ugly side of me that was very manipulative. And I feel, I still feel a lot of shame over that idea. And still, I'm trying to work hard, make it up to her with my life now to be able to, you know, to, to make amends on that. But it's, it's just an ugly side of me that was, that was coming out at that time. And you said she saw the real you. I don't know if you've spoken about this or not, but what did she see in you? I still try and figure that every day. <laughs> I mean, she, uh, <laughs> that's, I, I say that to my wife too, but, but <laughs> she saw in me, I believe somebody that, that was troubled, that was a genuinely good person that, that wanted to be good in the world. And I, I genuinely wanted to be that. And that's what I wanted to think of myself over time. You know, even though I didn't know about it at the beginning, I, I, I discovered that I had an anxiety disorder. Uh, you know, panic attacks, obviously that, that became apparent. And then I started getting medication for it. And that's really how the doctors treated it. I didn't want to go to, I, I didn't want to go to a therapist at the time when I was in college, because again, that would, you know, my secret would be out the, the cure that I thought was for my anxiety, the alcohol, they would immediately just say, well, that's your problem. Stop doing it. So I knew that the, the answer, I just couldn't stop. What was it that happened in your life that made that shift for you? Over time, I made, I, I did a lot of things, uh, uh, I set a lot of rules for myself while I was drinking to basically convince myself that I wasn't a problem drinker or that I can control it. And that was what it was all about for me was really control. Um, I wanted to control my anxiety. So drinking would make it go away right away. So that was the control. I wanted to control my drinking. So I set these rules for myself, like don't drink before 5 PM or don't drink on the weekdays. Don't drink while, uh, on work days or, or, or anything like that. And the biggest rule that I had set for myself because it was so aligned with my values was don't drink and drive because I hated the idea that people were so selfish that they would get in an automobile and risk other people's lives by drinking and driving for many, many years while I was drinking, I never drank and drove, um, until, you know, I did and ended up getting in a DUI accident. Walk, walk us through what, what was this? Was, were you following your rules? Was it a weekday? Was this a weekend? Where were you going? What, what happened? This was a weekend and it was, uh, uh, it was to the point where I was actually, uh, where I was actually going surfing. And in the mornings I, I was at a point where I was waking up and drinking in the morning to make sure that I was, you know, it was kind of that hair of the dog where I was, uh, where I would wake up starting to get that, that jittery sensation starting to yeah. get that anxiety. You just, wanted, so, you just wanted to calm, calm, yeah. calm the shakes and calm the nerves and all that stuff and get ready for a great day of surfing. Right. Yeah. 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 So I, so I did that and I remember bits and pieces of being out and surfing and coming back, but I, I don't remember the drive home, whether it be, 
you know, because I was in a blackout, obviously I was, but, but I don't remember being on the drive, getting in the accident or anything like that. The last, the next thing I remember was coming to in the back of a police car. What's going through your mind in that moment? Tremendous shame. You know, I was close to my home. So I, did you know what happened? Like you, you wake up and you're in the back of a police car and it like instantly hits you. You exactly, you exactly know what happened. I didn't exactly know what happened. No. Um, I, I could only piece together that, you know, something had happened while I was drinking and that, that I caused some, some problems. And it was one of my biggest fears because a lot of my anxiety re- revolved around this, this idea of um, what did I do while I was blacked out? And it was this fear and this massive fear. That, and this was that fear coming to realization because I just didn't know, you know, what it was. I, I was told that I, you know, was, had drank and drove and, and that, uh, you know, and that's, and that, and so I was doing the sobriety field test and that's kind of when I, when I figured it out, but I still didn't put the pieces together. And uh, so I had sat in jail, basically trying to wonder what I had done. And, and also this feeling of just immense shame because it, I had done something that I, I was, I, I had so hated. I became something I hated because I was now just putting, not putting myself at risk, which was, you know, which was fine with me at that point. Like, you know, I didn't, I didn't really care about myself, but now I was putting other people in danger. And that started the, the uh, tailspin of me thinking about ending my life at that point and just wanting to die. Um, I didn't really feel I had the uh, gut to be able to actually do it myself, but I just, I wanted to be struck down dead at that point and, uh, and kind of take a coward's way out. But I was also realized then, you know, sometime within the net, those, those uh, first days of that shame of, of, not being allowed to go back home to my wife at that point. So going into my parents' house who were, they were away on your vacation. Wife, your wife threw you out? Yeah. She, she, uh, she did not let me come home for, uh, I think it was for a couple of days after that. And, uh, and until we were able to talk and um, until I was, you know, committed at that point to get sober. And it's important to note that, that at that time, you know, the, the first thing in my mind is I, I understood where she was coming from. I didn't know why she was with me for so long. So I thought, you know, I thought for sure that if she was going to end it with me, I mean, she was, she was in the right, there was no question about it. I just, but I knew that, that I had one of two choices. It was either death or death or incarceration or get the help and actually do what people are saying in the rooms of, of, uh, recovery. And for me, it was Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and, uh, so, so pursuing that route, uh, but that became the first priority in my life was sobriety, not, not family, not my wife. I, I used to think, well, I can't do the recovery thing because I have, you know, I have my family, I have my wife, I have my kids to take care of. I have all, I have my job. How am I going to be able to do this? If I, if, or take care of my family, if I have to go to AA every day, it was like, no, my mindset changed. The first thing, the most important thing in my life was sobriety, because that was the only thing that I had and, uh, and nothing else would matter unless I was sober. Now, I know from your story that you didn't start to get into triathlons until about a year after recovery. So it's not like you went from one addiction to another. You didn't replace uh, alcohol with just like working out like crazy. So for that first year of recovery, what did you really embrace and what did you really learn? I really embraced what I what I was afraid of. And I won't speak for all addicts, but this tends to be a common theme that if you say I'm never going to drink again, that's a harmful statement because you always, it's always like, it's so final and alcohol has been such a big part of me that, that saying never, it's like, I mean, they say in, in a lot of the books you read that it's like cutting off an appendage, you know, you, you just, you, it's, it's such a hard uh, thing to come to terms with. But I embraced that fear of, of contrary action, of going against kind of what my brain was saying and, and maybe just, just for today. So I embraced the idea of that present, of that one day at a time element of just for today, I'm not going to drink. And uh, just for today, I'm going to go into a meeting. And just for today, I'm going to talk to somebody and ask them for help. That was always something I had a hard time with too, was, was asking somebody else for help. I felt like, well, why would they want to help me? I don't want to be a burden on somebody, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but I made a point of finding the most experienced and longest term sobriety and hardest core alcohol uh, AA person in the room and asking them to be my sponsor so that I could make sure that, that I could hold myself accountable in the best way possible. And it scared the hell out of me, but it was so worthwhile. 
And I know that challenge of people. And, and I mean, if, if people are entering the rooms for the first time and you have that willingness to, to really start it, I would really just challenge people to do that and, and really reach out for that help uh, because it, it makes such a big difference to just immerse yourself in the community and find the mentor in anything you do. I mean, you talk about, you know, personal development and, and, and really achieving your best thing. It all, it's all about a mentor. And that's the beauty of something like recovery, where you can find the mentor who shows you how to do it. Hey, it's these 12 steps. That's all you have to do, but you have to be fully involved in it and you have to go deep in it. And, uh, and if you're willing to do that, you know, that then there's light and there's hope you can stay sober. And that's what worked for me. Your story reminds me of something I heard from Dr. Drew. Dr. Drew from, I think, Loveline. And you know, he, he's certainly well-known. Mm -hmm. He was talking about life change, why, why some people change and some people don't, why at certain points in your life, you change and, and stay committed to the change and why other times you don't. And what he said so struck me because he said that the ultimate motivating factor, the ultimate thing that actually leads to the largest amount of change is the feeling of disgust. Mm -hmm. It's seeing yourself or your situation or who you are from outsiders' eyes for, for kind of the first time or at the very least in such a way where it hits you that, that this is you, that this is so out of alignment with who you think you could be or should be, and you're just disgusted. You're so disgusted with yourself that you just have to change. I know yeah. for myself with my health journey, I was always extremely heavy and 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 not very healthy. And then I hit that point of just like, is this, this, this is me, this is it. And I hit this point of disgust and the change happened. It sounds like your DUI was this moment of disgust where the change could happen, but it also seems like it could have very easily gone the other way where it's like, this is me. I guess this is who I am. And then you live out, there's another version of you somewhere in another universe where you're living out the rest of your life without your wife, without your kids, without any of that stuff. And you just went off some other way, no? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And um, and, and I love that Dr. Drew quote, by the way, and, and I can really relate to <laughs> that idea of the disgust being that that transformational trigger, because that that's exactly how I felt. You know, walking out, like sitting in the jail cell, seeing how I was rightfully treated by the the officers in in the jail who have to see that kind of stuff every single day. You know, walking out of the jail, I remember exactly what the the one of the young uh, guards there had said as I was walking out. He said, uh, um, he said, "Well, we'll be. I guess we'll be seeing you tomorrow, you drunk." And I was like, "Oh, you know." And it was just so it it hit me so hard at that point where I was just I was so angry. And so resentful, but I, it wasn't even geared towards him. Even then I understood why he would think that, but it was all towards me because he was right. I mean, I mean, if I didn't change, that's how it was going to be tomorrow. You know, he very well might, might've seen me again. And there definitely is if, if, if there's the multiple universe idea and, uh, and there's those transition points, there's definitely another person out there that that's like me, maybe still drinking, probably, well, probably dead by this point or you know, what have you, um, who's definitely, uh, uh, lying in a gutter somewhere. Tony Robbins has this process called the, called the Dickens process. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's, it's where you really think of that, where, where you put yourself in two scenarios. That first one is the most is, is you put yourself 10 years into the future and you think of how things will look if, if it doesn't change, you put yourself there visually, you put yourself there mentally and, and you hear the things you smell the things and, and you really feel it. That's what I feel when I do that process, because that's who I could be if I didn't change. And that's who I could be if I picked up a drink right now. Uh, I, I know that for a fact, but, you know, putting it the other way, what could I be if I did change, you know, looking 10 years into the future, what is the opposite of that? And that's what I strive for. That's why I try to visualize instead. And, um, and yeah, it's yeah. a powerful process. That Dickens process, uh, the first time I went to a Tony Robbins Unleash the Power Within, my friend Evan Carmichael took me down and I was down there with him and he's sitting beside me and we're working through this process now. Uh, Evan Evan works with the Robbins group and so we're sitting in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> Tony's like, this is 2018. Tony's in front of us on stage. He's like so into it, like his sweat, he's spitting, it's hitting us, all this stuff. But I'm working through this process and uh, my health was actually one of those things. Mm. And Tony pushes you and we don't want to give away too much if you haven't worked through because it it's super powerful, but he pushes you to like really imagine how bad it could be. Like make it worse, make it worse, make it worse. 
And so I'm thinking, well, if I don't change my health, my diet, my exercise, if I don't take this seriously, I think I was like 36 at the time. I said, well, what? Maybe I'll die young. Uh, that's not painful enough. Maybe I won't be there, you know, to walk my daughters. I have four kids. Maybe I won't be there for their weddings. Mm-hmm. Oh, that'd be terrible. And then, and then the thing that really got me, and I, I remember telling Evan this, and I couldn't even say the words out loud because I was, I was crying too hard. And I just remember looking at his eyes and he had such sympathy for me in that moment. But I was like, what if I never meet my grandkids? Like, like what if, what if, because I'm just too, I don't, I don't know why I'm not willing to change. I don't know what it is, but, but what if I'm, I'm never going to meet my grandkids Mm -hmm. and, and how selfish that is of me to take that away from them, to have that person in their life. And so that was the thing where it's like, I'm on the treadmill. I'm like, I'm meeting my grandkids, I'm meeting my grandkids. I'm like working out. I'm like, I'm meeting my grandkids. And it worked for like, for a year and a half. Like I'd be sometimes on the treadmill crying. Cause I'm like, I'm going to meet my grandkids. <laughs> and so, and so it's, it's super powerful. I, I almost wished, or, or maybe there is, but I almost wished that I can make more of these major life changes in my life without waiting for that level of disgust to kind of hit. Now mm-hmm. I know you have, on the back end of your story, like we're going to get into the, into the health and the fitness and the triathlons and all of that stuff. But on the back end of the story, is there a way to be able to make more of these life changes happen without waiting for rock bottom or waiting for disgust or having to wait for Tony Robbins to yell at you to make these changes? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that's a great question because, you know, I, I struggle with that all the time. We tend to fall back into those or at least I tend to fall back into those, those feelings of, of comfort, but, you know, in, in what I've experienced uh, and, and what helped me to kind of look at those next things was, was really focusing and really having that, that daily practice of, of looking at the things that I, that I have achieved that I thought that I could, that first one was sobriety, you know, by taking those steps. Now I have a framework for how to achieve something. I don't have to get disgusted with myself to make a transformation. Is it still hard to stay sober all these years later? It's, it's not, I mean, at this, I mean, at this point in time, uh, I still take it a, a day at a time, but one thing that stuck with me that, that my sponsor told me early on was, was it doesn't get easier. It gets better. And that really stuck with me because life, there's still things that are thrown at me. I mean, I'm still facing a lot of challenge. I mean, I still have anxiety. It's not like anxiety goes away when you get better. I mean, um, you transcend it, you, you figure out, you get some tools to, to work with it and to manage it and maybe turn some of those feelings into superpowers or, or, uh, realize that it can be a, a, a friend instead of a foe, but it's still, it's still with me. And, you know, I still experience really challenging things, but I've experienced more challenging, uh, things in my life since being sober than, than before, but I've been able to deal with them because I'm sober and, uh, I haven't had a desire to drink, which is the important thing. So I would say it's not easy and it doesn't, um, I guess trying to stay sober isn't as much of a daily function, but it's something to continue to be conscious of, but I don't have the desire to drink anymore which is, which is a blessing. It took a few years to get there where I would no longer have any desires. And I hope that's, that that's amazing. That continues through day. I, yeah. I, I have a feeling that, that listeners and viewers are going, this is a pretty heavy conversation, but actually to me, this is just a hopeful conversation mm-hmm. because if anything, it's, it's, it, it proves that change is possible that in the darkest time, you know, you're in jail your wife won't talk to you. You think you've lost everything. That's, that's like, that's a sliver. It's a moment. It's, it's, it's a season that you were able to work your way, claw your way, get your way out of, but that you can, you can work through this stuff. And so was it about sobriety? Was it about conquering anxiety and working through fear? Was it about getting healthy and and facing these new challenges as you started to take on triathlons? What was the order of of the things you had to knock out in order to at least clear your head and get to kind of the the day one of the reset? So getting to that reset, so having that framework of anxiety of, of that first year of sobriety, I spent that whole first year working on my my psychological, my mental, my spiritual well-being. That that was that was my that was my one focus. Stay sober, stay sober. You know, work the steps, get that. Um, you know, get get my mind clear into that point. And I would always hear a lot of uh, 
you know, a lot of things from the elders in, in Alcoholics Anonymous saying, don't make any major life changes uh, until you've had a year of sobriety, right? And so I always took that because of my personality. I, I heard that as make a major life change once you hit a year of sobriety. <laughs> yeah. And, it's like you're you're like checking off the calendar. You're like, okay, here we are. Major yeah. life change. <laughs> got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, so before I ever even got sober, you know, that, that seed was, was planted in my mind of, you know, this Ironman thing. Like I, I saw it on television at one time, watching the Ironman world championship on, on television, on NBC, they have a broadcast every year of the Ironman world championship. And I was watching it and I was watching all of the uh, huge views of Hawaii and, and all of these racers and crossing the finish line and these enormous distances. Like I heard, I heard the announcer say it's 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, 26 mile run all in one day. And I thought to myself, I couldn't even visualize the swim part of it because I didn't even know that distance, but the bike over a hundred miles, that was like, oh my gosh, how could you do that? How could you ride a bike for a hundred miles? I hate driving that far. And then, uh, and then to run a marathon on the back of that, I'd never run a marathon. I, at that point, I'd, I'd maybe run a half marathon a couple of times, uh, just to, you know, just trying to power through it. But the idea of running a marathon was just like, no way. I, I don't want to, I, I know what a half marathon feels like. Screw that. But I watched it and I watched all these people crossing the finish lines. And I was so inspired by that because they kept talking about all of the challenges that these people had overcome. They kept talking about, you know, how they were normal people like teachers, lawyers, and doctors and things like that. And it really resonated with me because they started talking about specific challenges like, uh, uh, you know, like maybe like one person had ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease and still powered through. And he said he'd, he'd get himself across the finish line, even if he had to roll across. And sure enough, he came to the finish line and he rolled himself across. And I was just watching that. And I was like, oh my gosh, all of these people you know, here I am just drinking with this like anxiety and this fear of all this stuff, but that would be so cool to do that kind of stuff, to do that and to be that happy, to be that free. And there's immediately as that, that notion came, you know, the fear just entered my mind and said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. And I just never thought of it again. And I was like, okay, well, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, you know, as I say in the book, I drank another beer and went on feeling sorry for myself for the next, you know, few years or so. But this moment, hold on this moment, yeah. To, to see what others are doing, to be inspired, to feel that like, how awesome would it be to have that or to do that or to experience that? And then what happens in our mind, right? The, the, the chatter that you can't do it or you don't have the time or you don't have the money or what are you talking about or all of that stuff. Like, like that very thing is the thing that keeps amazing people from starting new companies or, or artists from pursuing their art or all of us from doing all of the things that we are that we could do with our lives mm -hmm. if we could just not listen to that voice or if we could just say it doesn't matter or whatever now you have whatever i don't know an 8 year or 10 year gap between that moment of inspiration and then you circling around on it you know if we were able to close that gap if we weren't listening to our voice how great life would be but eventually it catches up to you where you're like hey there was that thing that we did and and that second time did your voice come back with, I can't do it? Or were you already crushing that? It, it, it did come back. Uh, and well, I'm sorry, the voice that said it, I couldn't do it. Didn't come back, uh, that second time. And first time I saw it, a seed was planted, but that that's all that happened. It was that seed was planted, that spark was lit and, and it became a point of reference for me of a, of a period in time that was so specific for something great that I could make a choice. It was one of those, you know, again, one of those crossroads where, Maybe there was a, a a version of me that took that other crossroads, you know, got his got his shit together and started working toward it, um, and and did that. But but I didn't. I, I I took the other path. But when I was a year sober, I had this other point of reference where you know I did something that I never thought that I could do. I got sober, and I did it through these you know simple steps uh, that weren't easy, but they were simple. And you know, just taking those simple steps one at a time of of getting there, taking it one day at a time. I got sober and I'm still sober a year later today. And so I was recovering from a shoulder surgery at the time. Um, dur during that time, I was, I uh, uh, had 
injured it doing something stupid. Actually, I listened to Tony Horton on <laughs> Tony your podcast. Tony Horton was on the podcast, yeah. <laughs> I know you injured it from your story doing something with P90X, so we, yeah. won't... <laughs> we won't go there. But I, I, I have to say that I, I still use Abrifer X today. I, oh, and, yeah. Uh, Tony, if you're listening, so we, we still like you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I, I uh, so I was recovering from that shoulder surgery and I, I was just sitting in bed and because I couldn't do anything, I was thinking to myself, man, I'd, I'd love to go outside. I'd love to actually start getting healthy because I hadn't been focusing on my physical health. I'd been focusing on my spiritual mental health and in the rooms of recovery, a lot of people are smoking outside. So I was joining them and, and, you know, that was how I got the community. So smoking, going out for coffee or donuts or things like this. And so I wasn't in great shape at all. And I, I, uh, so I was lying in bed, you know, recovering, eating peanut M&Ms doing all this. And, and it just, it, it entered my mind. I think that the conditions were right. The environment was right for it to come back to me that I was just like, well, what can I do? I am a year sober. I'm supposed to make a life change now. (laughs) It's prescribed. uh, I'm supposed to do it one year later. They told me I had to, I, uh, I, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling inspired to like get healthy and fit. What can I do? And then it just entered my mind. Like, I remember that time when I was watching that thing, that triathlon, that crazy event, And I remember that same feeling entered my mind of like that, you know, that, that kind of those butterflies that you get that are excitement and fear rolled into one. And it could either, it could either manifest itself as, oh yeah, I'm definitely going to do that. Or, oh no, 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 I'm, I'm definitely not doing that. Well, this time around, instead of saying, well, you can't do that. I said, well, what if I could? And then that started just like, get my mind racing on, well, I, I, I want to do that Ironman Hawaii. I want to be one of those people crossing that finish line in slow motion, you know, giving the fist bump and enjoying myself. And so the first thing that I did was I looked online, how do you sign up for Ironman Hawaii? And I realized right away that you can't just sign up for Ironman Hawaii. You have to qualify for it. And it's really hard. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I started kind of digging in a little bit more and doing more research on, on how to go about that and finding out there are these qualifying events. So after kind of sitting on it for a little while and, and, and doing some research and starting to just go out and walk, because that's really all I could do. I signed up for Ironman Cabo that was going to happen a little bit over a year later uh, in March of 2014 and decided I was going to build a parachute on the way down, figure out how to do it. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. Now, in terms of your story, I mean, we could get certainly into all of the, the, the different Ironman, you know, challenges and the lessons learned. But one thing I want to spend a little bit of time on is you really pride yourself on being able to, to, to reframe anxiety and fear as a superpower. Mm -hmm. As someone who uh, struggles with this myself, I want to believe that that's true and that's possible. I've worked with therapists. I've asked them these questions, and I and I haven't yet landed on something where it feels like it's worth it. Right. <laughs> I mean, you don't have any other option, but it's not like to me a superpower should be like you know, like when when I speak to people with ADHD as entrepreneurs, and they're like, "Well, here are all the ways that it holds me back, but I've managed that. Here are all the amazing things it allows me to do." Like. Where's the amazing list when it comes to having constant worry, constant fear, constant anxiety, constant stress? And I'll preface by saying that that the negative symptoms of anxiety for me they they don't go away. I mean, I had a panic attack two weeks ago. I got overwhelmed, and and uh, you know that panic it's it's there. You know, I think the way that I I really looked at it, and even going through that process of starting that Ironman journey, I was afraid to swim. I had all this anxiety around that. The the first step of of that really was was just knowing naming it just calling it what it is it's it's an anxiety uh disorder it's just it's a magnified sense of fears and it's a magnified sense of this sensation that we have that is there to protect us really fear is not necessarily an enemy i mean it it's if we didn't have it we'd all be running around like psychopaths you know <laughs> doing all these crazy things but for some of us, we have that magnified sensation uh, that, and sometimes goes to the irrational. And at least recognizing that as the first step is is an important step, because then we can start to reframe it and look at it in another way. And for me, I started looking at well, how can the negative symptoms, or how can these these things that I'm experiencing be positive, or how have they been positive in my life? And when I looked at something like the obsession, like the obsessive nature, I have a bit of that OCD element. I'm like, you know, did I turn the lights off and, you know, going back and flipping them on or I I have this obsessive personality and it actually serves me in a lot of ways. 
when I was younger, I, I played the cello and I would be able to practice for three hours a day. And that would fill my cup because I, I enjoyed music so much that, you know, it, it, it gave me a sense of, of purpose. And I ended up getting into college because of that, that cello. Now I quickly gave it up after I got into college because I started becoming a little bit more dysfunctional, but, but that obsessive nature became an element for me that also helped me in, in triathlon. You know, I, I was able to sit on a trainer for five hours a day and push it. So I recognized where that superpower is because I have this you know, anxiety issue or heightened self-awareness is another, another one that I have where, you know, that heightened self-awareness in social situations is like, you know, what are other people thinking about me? Uh, am I saying the wrong things? Am I doing this? Am I doing that? But it's also, if you flip it on its head can be a powerful thing. You can, you know, look at others and be more compassionate. You can be more empathetic. And I think that's a powerful way to reframe it. It's, and it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of work for, for me. And it doesn't make the negative symptoms go away, but it at least gives some positive element. That's why I like to call it a superpower. When I, when I read the old comic books or I look at superheroes and all these kinds of things that you, you notice one trend that, that Stan Lee and all these guys write about is, is those superpowers usually come from some kind of maybe either character defect or challenge that somebody faces, but it becomes a powerful ally in whatever they're trying to accomplish. And that's all I'm saying is that, that, that there's a yin and yang to it. And, uh, and, and that's been a powerful force in my life to at least turn it around and make life more fulfilling while I have to live with it and, and continue to work with it. This is going to sound really silly, but the, the other weekend I was painting my kitchen and I, you know, with these big projects, <laughs> painting a kitchen, not a big project, right? But, but, you know, you got all of the taping and all of the trim and all of the cutting, you know, cutting in and then the rolling and all that stuff. I realized that I'm, I'm just going to do the simple stuff first. Cause then the big project isn't such a big project is I'm going to start the stuff that's fun. Mm -hmm. Then you run out of the fun stuff and then you do the simple stuff. And this is, this is how silly fear or anxiety can be though. You know, when you have to paint the ceiling, you have to wrap everything. Otherwise you get little spots everywhere. Yeah. I didn't, I was like, oh, I don't want to take the time to wrap everything, but if I don't wrap everything, I'm going to get little spots. And, and literally I, I wasted probably a day where I just didn't make any progress on this project mm -hmm. because I didn't want to do it. So I woke up in the morning and said, I'm going to, I'm going to paint the seal. <laughs> and then I did it. And I realized it only took 25 minutes <laughs> and it was done. And I was like, why was I afraid of something as silly as this? Now, you don't know me, but like, I am a very handy person. Like I have renovated houses. I've bought in bulldozers and I've like, I am like a super handy person. I'm an entrepreneur. I will attack anything. Why was I afraid to paint a ceiling? Like what a, what a silly and embarrassing thing. And yet in my mind, I'm, I'm building up all of these things. And so yeah. what I, the point I'm trying to make here is often I think outsiders look at this and go, there's successful people. And then there's failures. But the truth is that allowing this anxiety or this fear to slow us down is actually just mediocrity. Mm -hmm. It's actually just this vanilla middle of the road. And you still may be a higher achiever than those in your life, but you're not living up to your full, fullest potential because the fear is keeping you from, from kind of pushing through. Yeah. How have you been able to, like, what is the thing, if, if that's the exercise, if that's diet, if that's control, if it's your morning routine, what is the thing that you do that helps remind you of what your fullest potential really is? Yeah, I think it's, it, it is that mindset and, and that practice, that discipline every morning, just to do the same things that prime me for the, for the day. Those things help to, to really show me what I am. And, and I fail at that a lot. Talk about failure. Like I mentioned, I had a panic attack two weeks ago just because I had so much going on and I was overwhelmed and it, and it got to me. Was that, was that a failure? I mean, maybe, but it's also, you know, it's also part of who I am. Uh, and it's an opportunity to, to grow. But I think that that one thing that, that I, that I want to do is, is, is continue to push that 5% beyond my comfort zone. Um, that, and that helps me to, you know, to continue to at least grow the realm of what I believe is, is possible for myself. Uh, that that's really what achieving an Ironman for me was, was all about because it, when I was with sitting in bed with a shoulder injury and signing up for my first Ironman, I had no business doing so. 
And if I were to look forward a year from then and say, can I accomplish an Ironman in a year? I would be like, no way. I just, I don't even know how to swim 25 yards, let alone like, you know, 2.4 miles. How am I going to do that? Well, the answer was the same way I got sober one step at a time and, and just taking that one step that's 5% beyond the comfort zone. Um, and so doing those things over and over again, day in and day out, what's the next thing that I would need to do? Well, uh, right now I don't know how I, I can only, I can only swim 25 yards in a pool. So today I'm going to aim for 50 or, you know, whatever that is, you know, that that's, that's really what it is. Or if it's, if it's in, you know, entrepreneurship or, or starting a business, it's like, okay, well, I, uh, I'm afraid of calling people to ask them to buy my product. I mean, which is a legitimate thing for me. Well, I'm, I'm going to call five people or I'm going to call one person a day. It's whatever that, like, whatever makes you a little bit squeamish, but you can, you know, that you can achieve, you know, just, just doing, taking that step, taking it to the extreme. You know, I, I, I love Laird Hamilton's view on this because we always think of somebody like Laird Hamilton, who's a big wave surfer. He surfs the biggest waves in the world. We would look at him at what he does. And we say, that guy is fearless. There's no way that guy has any fear. Well, he admits all the time that of course he has fear. The difference is, is that when he gets afraid, he does that thing right away because he knows that that's the challenge for him to actually go out and do it. He talks about wiping out so badly one time that his friend got injured and that he had to send him, take him to shore and make sure that he was okay. But then he said, all right, I'm going to meet you at the hospital later. I got to go out and surf this wave again so that I'm not afraid of it next time. <laughs> it's just like, you know, I'm not, I'm not challenging people to surf big waves or anything like that, but it, it demonstrates an interesting point that the fear if it's, if it's an irrational fear, or if it's a fear that is, that is healthy for us to move beyond, then we should, we should pursue moving beyond it. That's amazing. Last question for you at the end of the day, what, what does it all come down to? For me, it, it comes down to continuous growth, continuous improvement, uh, continuous improvement as a father, as a husband, as a person, as, uh, um, you know, as, as whatever, it is because that leads to the fulfillment that, that we would all want to have. It leads to the fulfillment of my family of, you know, the people that I want to give back to. And if I'm not continuously growing, then I do atrophy. If I'm not continuously trying to push myself that 5% beyond, then I risk going backwards and I can't risk going backwards. It's just part of, part of who I am. And, and I'm, and I become no good for anyone. I ultimately, I just, I want to be the best person I can for everybody else. And that's really one of the reasons I wanted to put out, you know, this book and everything is to help people who might have that hopelessness because, you know, I come from that background of non-athletic, you know, non-athleticism and, and not knowing and, and being afraid and being constantly afraid. Um, and that doesn't have to be a life that we have to live. So I wanted to help give some hope in that direction, but continuous growth can lead to that. It doesn't have to be big growth just has to be incremental and continuous. 